Now I want to talk about error handling or exception handling. They're kind of synonymous in the world of C-sharp. And when dealing with exceptions, these are outcomes that you don't expect. If you look up exception in the dictionary, it's a person or thing that is excluded from a general statement and more significantly, it doesn't follow a rule. Take a look at this example right here. We're asking the user for two numbers we're putting their input, which is a string, into an integer variable right here. And we're using the method to int32 to accomplish that goal. So we're taking a string, converting it to an integer. The second thing we're doing here is dividing the two numbers together and putting it into a variable called result. Now this program, it's quite flaky. There's a couple of errors that can occur if we're not careful. And errors can generally occur when we're dealing with users because users do things we just do not expect sometimes. <laughs> so if I run the application, enter your first number. Now what if the user just types hello? What if they read it incorrectly and put their email address? Uh, you know, users can do anything. What if they accidentally hit enter and don't put any number? So there's lots of things a user can do to potentially break your software. And these are called unexpected things. So if I type in a lot of letters and hit enter, now you can see here we have this nice little error message here. It says exception unhandled. That basically means, okay, an error has occurred, an exception has, an, has occurred, and it's unhandled, which means we're not doing anything about it. So the computer cannot do anything about this error because it's trying to convert this into a number. It just cannot do it. It doesn't know what to do. So we need to tell the system how to handle this type of error. So if I look at this software here, this error happens when we take the user's input then try to convert it to a number. So if I hover over this method here, which we're using, this method to int32, you can see this dialog appears. It tells us what the method does. It tells us what the method gives us back as a return. But also there's this extra piece of information at the bottom here, which says exceptions. Now these are the two possible errors that can occur when using this method to int32. The first one is format exception, and that's the error that we just experienced. So we type in a word, for example, and then it's throwing what's called a format exception. That's because the format is not correct. It's expecting a number. We have some letters, so the format is wrong. The other error is an overflow exception. And I'm guessing that's when you enter a really large number and it can't physically fit it inside the data type, which is an integer. Now, a 32-bit integer goes to around 2 billion. So if I try and put in 5 trillion, then it would probably throw that other error, which is the overflow exception. So what we can do about this is handle these types of errors. So when the computer, you know, says, oh, you've given me a word, I wanted an integer, you know, I can't convert it, these words to an integer. We can kind of intercept this and say, okay, the user's entered some words, now I'm going to tell you how to handle this. And these are, this is how you sort of tackle this problem. The second error that can occur is when dividing by zero. So we take the two numbers from the user, assuming they've entered two valid numbers, we attempt to divide them together. However, if the second number is a zero, then another error is going to occur. So if I put zero, now we have another error. Uh, now it's unhandled again because we're doing nothing about it. And this type of error is a divide by zero exception. And the message, oh, we're trying to divide by zero. So the computer cannot physically do that. It doesn't know how. It just mathematically, it cannot divide by zero. But we're not telling it how to kind of get around this problem. And that's the aim of this uh, tutorial right now. I'm going to show you how we can handle exceptions. Now, this subject goes quite in depth, but we're just going to kind of scrape the surface here. So what we use here is a keyword called try. 
It's quite simple, D-R-Y. <laughs> like most keywords, we have our familiar curly braces and we end a curly brace here. So what try is doing is saying, can you try to do something for me, please? Because I have a feeling an error is going to occur. And we know that because when we hover over this method, there's two possible errors that can occur. And because we're asking input for the user, we know there's a sign of trouble coming. <laughs> so we're basically saying, please try this. So that's how the try keyword you know, kind of works. So we're trying something. Now what happens if this fails? So a try will either succeed and the, you know, the program runs as normal or an error may occur. And that part is the catch keyword. And again, curly braces just like before. Now a try cannot exist without a catch. If I remove the catch keyword here, then we'll get a red line. If I hover over that, it says expected catch or finally. So let's put that back. Now the kind of red line has gone away, it's happy. In this catch section here, this code will run if an error occurs here. So this is telling the system how to handle this error. So let's just say an error has occurred. Let's tell the user an error has occurred. So very generic. I think if I saw this error, I would be kind of annoyed uh, as a user because I have no idea what it means. It's very generic, <laughs> but uh, we can expand on that later. So let's just see if it works. So enter your first number. Let's put some words or letters. Now you can see we have a generic error. An error has occurred. Now our software hasn't crashed, so that's a good thing. Uh, but it's not really telling as much information. We just get this generic message. We don't know why it occurred. We don't know what went wrong. So it's not very useful to us, but at least our software hasn't crashed. So that's a good sign. Now let's take a look at how we can give better feedback to the user. We don't want to tell them an error has occurred because it's not really useful information. Um, the user cannot then go back and work out what they did wrong. So what we can do here next to catch is open and close parentheses and type in exception and then give it a name. This can be anything. It could be E, E, X. You can call it what you want. Basically, it's a, a variable we're setting up and the data type is of type exception. Just how we have a data type int, this one is exception. Now we'll cover what's called a kind of class later on, but uh, don't worry about that for now. But now we've defined this variable called E, which is of data type exception, we can use this to get some information about our error. So what I'm going to do here is uh, when we join strings together, we use a plus here. I'm going to say E dot message. Now message, message is a string property of uh, this exception variable here. And it's going to give us some uh, feedback. So the error message that explains the reason for the exception. So now if I run the application now and enter the first number, which is, you know, a lot of letters, now we have a bit more information. An error has occurred, the input string was not in the correct format. Now, when the user reads this, it could, they can think, oh, okay, yeah, I read the question wrong. I, I, I thought it was asking for my email address or something like that. So now we're providing useful information back to the user. Now, what if we want to kind of customize what will happen depending on the type of error that happened? Now, remember, um, there's a couple of problems with this application, a couple of things that can occur. Number one, the user can enter some letters and it con can't convert it to an integer. And we've kind of looked at that now. The other one is we attempt to divide by zero. But what's happening here is we're just doing this kind of one line of code. Whatever happens here, whatever error, you know, error is happening. So how can we kind of customize this? Maybe tell the user um, they've done something wrong if they accidentally enter some letters. Then maybe do something else if we divide by zero. So what we can do here is catch 
different types of exceptions. So if I copy and paste this, I'm going to put it here twice and I'll explain why soon. So the first kind of exception here that can happen is the format exception. So what I can do here is uh, catch the format exception right here. And what will happen here is if a format exception occurs, so any error to do with formatting, we can say to the user, I don't know, we could give them a really sarcastic message. <laughs> We could say, learn to read properly, because, uh, you know, they blatantly didn't read uh, the question, which was to enter a number, and then they enter their email address, for example. <laughs> and the other one was divide by zero. Okay, so divide by zero exception. And the message I might want to give the user... So, hey, buddy, you cannot divide by zero. What are you doing? <laughs> and then if it's not this kind of possible error and it's not this possible error, then this is our kind of generic one. So when we had that if statement, we had else if, else if, else if. Then finally, we had an else at the end. And similar with the switch statement, we had the case, case, case. Then at the end, we had default. This is kind of what that is aiming to do here. So if none of these errors occurred, we always kind of have our little safety net at the bottom that just, you know, kind of spits out a message here. And in the real world, you, you probably won't have just a message here. You would probably have the system log these errors differently and these errors differently. But this is just an example so you can see. So now if I run the application, I put in a word. Uh, it's now telling me to learn how to read properly. Charming, isn't it? <laughs> and now if I enter two numbers, I try and divide by zero. Hey, buddy, you can't divide by zero. So now you can see it's kind of doing two different things depending on what error occurred. The last thing I want to talk about is the finally keyword. Now, the finally keyword um, goes with a try keyword. It's optional, you don't have to use one, but it can be quite useful. So let's take a look at how it works. So finally, we'll either go after try or after all of the catches after the try. And if an error occurred, all the code in this finally block will be executed, even if an error occurred. If an error didn't occur, then this will also get executed. So it's quite useful maybe if you work with a database or what's called threads and you can kind of close out connections or finalize anything. That's kind of really what it's for. But in our small example here, we can just thank the user for using the program, for example. So I'm thanking the user for using the program. So let's take a look at this real quick. If I use the software and enter something invalid, we're telling the user to learn to read properly, then saying thank you for using our program. That's pretty sarcastic, isn't it? Now, um, let's enter some valid numbers. So now we get an actual result here. Um, and you can see the finally block is still getting executed. Thank you for using our program. So you can see finally is run regardless of whether an error occurred or not. And like I say, it's optional. You do not need this, but it can be quite useful. So that is how to catch and handle exceptions when working with C Sharp.